Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've joined us. We are studying the Sabbath School lessons, and we're doing it in advance so that we might share a few ideas with the rest of you. This lesson is one of the series on Galatians, entitled From Slaves to Heirs, and it's lesson number eight for November 19 of 2011. We'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and loving Father, as we consider these impassioned words, these very carefully thought out but very strong words from the Apostle Paul, may we catch his emotion, but more than that, may we catch the truth he intended to portray as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson covers some very significant issues in Christianity. Paul was determined to break down all, any barriers that might remain between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. For those of you who are familiar with the, the cultural setting in Paul's day, it is estimated that 60% of the people living in the Mediterranean world were slaves. Now these were not slaves as in, um, in modern times because of their race or some other reason. These were not just slaves because they had been captured in war or something like that, although some were. Most of them were slaves because they owed a debt and they had to pay off their debt or something like that. Uh, you could sell yourself into slavery to get to pay off a debt or something. Then in time, you would certain period of time, depending on what your debt was, you would be free once again. So things were handled quite differently in those days than they are now. So this was a significant problem. Paul suggests that when we join ourselves to the body of Christ through baptism, when we become Christians, every human being is eligible without any distinctions remaining. I'm sure that uh, many of you are aware that there was a famous Jewish prayer, male prayer, let me assure you, a famous Jewish male prayer that said, when he woke up first thing in the morning, Lord, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And Paul responds to that in these famous words in Galatians 3, 28 and 29. And one little thing, uh, extra thing I would like to throw in here, some of you may be aware that if you ask a Jewish scholar in modern times, those who have paid some attention to the New Testament, of course the Jews don't consider the New Testament as being inspired, but if you ask some of those who, who, scholars who may have studied some of the New Testament, they will tell you, they, as Jews, they don't have a big problem with Jesus. The one they have a problem with is Paul. And it's because of verses like this one I'm about to read to you that they are very adamantly opposed to some of the things that Paul says. He says in verse 28, so there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. Remember the, Gentile, the male Jewish prayer? Between slaves and free people, between men and women, you are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, if you're a baptized member of the Christian body, then you are a descendant of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. He just wiped out every special privilege that the Jews ever had in two sentences. Now, what do you mean by special privilege? Well, they always thought they were a very special people. And, and, and God promised them all kinds of things, and they claimed all the privileges, but they didn't want to bother with any of the responsibilities. And that's the story of the whole Old Testament. Well, do, you mean, do you mean they were better than everybody else? They're well, they thought so. They were God's special people. I mean, you can read that all through the Old Testament. I have, I have a tendency to, to um, you know, there are things that Paul writes and he gives limitations to women mm -hmm. uh, in certain passages. He says he doesn't want yes. them to speak in church and, mm -hmm. and some other things and so on and so in forth. In certain special settings, yes. And when I read this passage, I don't read this as a, as a and, and maybe I need to be corrected here, and I think it's often used this way, and, and so maybe I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't interpret this passage and be meaning, and I'm not trying to, to, to not say that these positions are correct, but I, I question whether this passage is correctly used to um, 
promote gender equity or anti-slavery and so forth. I, I, I interpret this passage to mean everyone is equal when it comes to having an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus and God, when it has an opportunity to, to gain whatever right might be necessary to walk through that through those pearly gates, mm -hmm. Paul is saying everybody is equal when it yes. comes to that. Yes. He's talking about salvation yes. here or a relationship to, to uh, the Creator. But if you put that together with other verses that Paul states, he says nothing else really matters. He's going to say a little bit later, everything else is nothing but rubbish. This is the only thing that counts. So where do we go from there? Do you mean the only thing that counts, like he says, is that you're a son of God? Yes. But he doesn't talk about gender equity here. I just read you the, t the verses about gender equity. I mean outside, like in a job or something like that. Well, that's not Paul's point here, no. You know, he's not talking about, you know, are you working for Nero or are you not working for Nero? He's talking, but if you look at the other verses, I mean, you know, this is, there's no question about the fact that this is, Paul's statement here is a direct response to that Jewish prayer. I, I don't think don't, anybody's, any question in anybody's mind who knows about the Jewish prayer, this is Paul's intentional jab at that Jewish exclusiv exclusivism. And as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, yes. he certainly knew Made that it. prayer and yep. had used it many times before the Damascus Road. Yes. Well, it, plus his whole argument is going against what these peoples came to the the um, um, the people and said that you had to do certain things and become a certain type of people, and then you can be accepted by God. Yeah. So that's one thing that he's going against right Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Well, I think he's also speaking in favor for the Jews um, to basically open their eyes to their pride mm -hmm. because God says one of the worst sins you can commit is pride yeah. and he hates pride. So I think it's also, a, in a sense, a kindness toward the Jews because it's, he's trying to wake them up yeah. to what their need is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think I think Paul felt that he was speaking to himself, to his former self, let me put it that way. I think he recognized that that's where I used to be. And I think uh, this very interesting passage on our screen uh, helps to add a lot of meaning to that. The Christian, the Chinese Christian watchman Ni put it like this when asked about it by a new convert. The convert complained, no matter how much I pray, no matter how hard I try, I simply cannot seem to be faithful to my Lord. I think I'm losing my salvation. And uh, when I s mentioned that, I, I think of a trip that my wife and I made to Beijing some years ago. And we managed somehow or other to find, with some help from some strange sources, to find the Adventist church on Sabbath morning. And I can tell you, you, when you walked in there, they seated you because they could not allow any places to be empty. You couldn't pick a spot where you wanted to sit down. Every place was jammed. When the, when the main sanctuary was full, they were seating people in rooms, other places that had TV connections. They, they were there and they wanted to be there. I can assure you. Anyway, Nee said, do you see this dog here? He is my dog. He is house trained. He never makes a mess. He's obedient. He's a pure delight to me. Out in the kitchen, I have a son, a baby son. He makes a mess. He throws his food around. He fouls his clothes. He is a total mess. But who is going to inherit my kingdom? Not my dog. My son is my heir. You are Jesus Christ's heir because it is for you that he died. So I think that's a very clear way of, of sort of pointing out the issues. We may be sinners, we may do all sorts of bad things, but if we claim to be Christians, then God is ready to accept us as children and heirs. Now, one of the questions that you might raise, well, why does he keep saying sons, sons, sons? And I think there's a clear reason in Paul's context. 
He uses the son instead, son, the word sons instead of children because in biblical times, the sons were the ones who received the inheritance. Daughters were expected to marry into another family and they would get their inheritance through that family through their husbands to a different family. So daughters in, in, in Bible times were generally not given inheritance because they were expected to join a different family. And furthermore, the children of Israel were called the sons of God. So that terminology had special meaning for the Jewish people. Now Paul says, I want you to understand, you people who are used to be called Gentile sinners, that God wants to make you an essential part of his family. He doesn't want to discriminate against you in any way. And so he's calling you children of Abraham. Now, you can't be in a higher position than that as a Jew. If you're a son of Abraham, you're in. How did the current Jews take Paul's um, talks where he said well, this? That's what I was mentioning a few moments ago. Most of them don't study Paul at all. The ones who do, do not like it. I mean, way back in Paul's time. Oh, wait, well, that's what this whole book is ba about. He's, he's absolutely opposed to what they're trying to do to the, to the Jewish Christians, so the I mean, ones, to the Gentile Christians. The ones that would agree with him might become Christians, and the ones who didn't would voice their dissent or yes. voice. And, and right after they voiced their dissent, they began to pick up stones. <laughs> <laughs> he recounts yeah. several experiences with stones. Yeah. yeah. But while some places in the Bible suggest, Romans 6 is an example, that by baptism we're actually buried with Christ and we become a part of the body of Christ. It's not the physical act, it's not the going under the water and coming back up again that makes you into a new person. It's the baptism, if you will, of the Spirit, the, the being born of the Spirit and, and clothed in Christ is the, the words that Paul sometimes uses. This means that Christ becomes the center of your life, the most important part of your life. If we're going to receive that amazing inheritance that Jesus is offering us, then Christianity, our new identity, must affect every part of our lives. Now, maybe this is a difficult question, but did Paul say you had to be baptized in order to have the Holy Spirit come into your life? No, he's saying that you, you need to have the Holy Spirit come into your life, at least in his, his terms. He thought you need to do that first and then you can be baptized in the water. Okay, that would lead you to want to be baptized. Where did he get this information? I'll let you ask him that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I have to assume that he got it in vision from God. Um, you know, he, he, after the Damascus Road experience, he preached for a short time in Damascus, then he went out into the Arabian Desert. We don't know how long he stayed there. He came back and he began to preach the gospel, the Christian gospel with incredible power. And I can only assume that while he was out there in the desert, he was probably guided by the Holy Spirit. He had most of the Old Testament already memorized in his head. He was rethinking all of that, going through it in his mind, reworking it and trying to figure out how it fit with the new Christianity that he just adopted. And I think between the Old Testament scriptures and between the, his in being re, what was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, he came out with a solid gospel that he would not, he was unshakable. He, he, he was exposed to, certainly to some, but I don't know if it was there, any indication he ever was exposed to Jesus himself. I, I got no. under the impression that that wasn't the case, but he certainly, there's some indication he was exposed to other Christians like Stephen, wasn't he there at Stephen? So he, he had probably heard Stephen speak and, yes. and preach at least he more than there one. Hold, holding his coats, wasn't he? Right. Holding coats. And heard other Christians, maybe even, well, he certainly knew Peter mm -hmm. and, um, and Barnabas. And had some words to right. say to them. <laughs> right, yeah. And uh, so um, I, I'm like you. I have a tendency to think he picked up an awful lot of this when he was out in that Arabian desert, just mm -hmm. as Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. well, well, don't you think that when he, he gets these pieces, new pieces of information, and it fits so well that a lot of this stuff just just becomes apparent? Yeah. You know, right. and I think a lot of that was apparent to him and very straightforward to him, and he just spoke it. Probably. 
probably filled in a lot of um, a lot of missing components to what he understood from the Old his, Testament. His jigsaw puzzle started coming together. Right, yeah, yeah. Isn't it interesting how God will put you in a in a timeout in a in in a thinking mm -hmm. zone? Uh, he had Moses uh, thinking as a shepherd. He had Jesus. He had yep. Paul now. And sometimes I think when we think we're being shut out or sequestered, that may be our most valuable time. Yep. I spent uh, 17 years in Africa. And a number of those years would start with my, I had a little, little cubby hole in the attic. It was the only place that was available in my house that wasn't occupied by something else. And I had a ladder that climbed up, so I had to climb in the attic. Five o'clock every morning, I would spend a couple of hours uh, studying the Bible, reading through uh, materials from Alan White. I read all the way through Review and Herald articles, all six volumes, the big green, blue, and Herald articles. If you, if you've seen those big volumes, and it was a, it was a life-transforming experience. I thought. We yeah, we need that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens? How how does this, this transformation that takes place under the power of the Holy Spirit? How does that actually work? How what happens to us? Varies from person to person, I think. Yes. But there's a, a basic principle that's involved. It's found in Great Controversy, page 555. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it's, it's, we express it in just a few words. By beholding, we become changed. By beholding, we become changed. And what does that mean? Well, children, as they grow up, they watch their parents. They, they start doing things like their parents. They speak like their parents. They use gestures like their parents, etc. How does that happen? They watch, and then they try to copy. So how should we become like Christ? So when, Christ. when we're not Christian, we're beholding maybe the TV and our neighbors. But when we become Christian, we start looking, seeing who is God, who is God. And that's when we start becoming changed as we shift what we're beholding. What we're focusing on, yes. What we're focusing on. And that's, I, in my opinion, that's the main reason why Jesus came and lived that life and, and died that death here on this earth. Now we can see him. So that's why it's so nice and important to think about him and let our thoughts dwell on him. Yep and read about him and pray there, to there's him. There's a famous passage in the early par portion of Desire of Ages that says, it would be well to spend a thoughtful hour every day thinking about Christ and focusing on Christ and especially the closing scenes of his life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways we do that, or the main way we do that, is by reading the Bible, studying the Bible. It's and talking with our friends about the Bible, as we're doing right now. You're singing praises. Mm -hmm. Well. And so, if we're doing that, if we're doing it correctly, do our friends and associates at work and even our casual acquaintances recognize Christ in us? Yes. Remember the famous verse in Matthew 5, 16? In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise you for being such a nice person. Is that what it says? No, they're going to see you and they're going to praise your Father in Heaven. Why would they praise your Father in Heaven? I mean, it's you, isn't it? It's because they see God in what you do. That's what that's all about. So do you aim for that? If you aim to become like Jesus. Well, you know, some people don't know what they see. They mm -hmm. see you and they want to focus on you're a good person. And you want to say, no you know, you don't realize the real me mm -hmm. or something. So I don't know if secular people who are not Christians really see God in you, but then they start getting curious, what makes you that way? But to actually say, I see God, they have no idea, really. That, I'm sure that's true in many cases. On the other hand, the child, and that's our example, he looks at the parent, the parent has not a clue about, I mean, the child has not a clue about God when he's first growing up. He looks at mom and dad, and they are God to him. He doesn't know that, but they are God to him. And he wants to be like mommy and daddy. Now, you know, when I'm not trying to make this into some kind of, you know, 
touchy-feely kind of a deal, but if people look at us and say, I would like to be like that, then I think that's an indication that they're seeing God in us. And that's the way it should be, right? But where's the transition when they stop saying they're seeing you and then they say, this is God? Is that when you let them know that you go to church? You, can, you, you can let them know yeah. that God helps you? Or after a while they say, this, this couldn't be just a selfish human being. There's something else going on here. And they might be smart enough to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? But there's another thing, mm -hmm. is some people will see you change mm -hmm. and not want to have anything to do with you anymore. There may that's, be some like that's that. That's another witness that yeah. they see a change in you. Yeah. And that may be true, that they realize that they're being motivated and being you know, attracted in a completely different direction. They may not want anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. They're not comfortable with your influence. Mm -hmm. So what's implied by being an heir of Christ? I mean, joint heirs with Christ. Paul actually uses those words. That means you're going to inherit the same thing Jesus inherits. No. What does Jesus inherit? Eternal the life kingdom. and the heavenly kingdom. Christ. The whole universe, right? The whole universe belongs to him. Joint heirs with Jesus. We sing that song, don't we? Joint heirs with Jesus, yes. And Satan's number one purpose is to steal your inheritance from you. How can, how can Christ be an heir when he owns it all in the first place? Well, I mean, <laughs> we, we say that because we think of him as a son. He was a son of Mary. So we say he's a son. Um, I like to tell the story that's, that's passed along, and I don't even know where the origin of it was, but it was a black pastor in the south of the United States that was telling the story about Jesus when he was 12 years old, and when he was there in the temple, and the, 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 the big people with their fancy hats on were questioning him, the scholars, and they were just asking all sorts of things. And finally one of them said, Son, how old are you? And I'm sure that this good black pastor put words in Jesus' mouth that it was appropriate, it was true anyway. He said, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, yes, we believe God has always, Jesus has always been there, but from our perspective, he, 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 he chooses to identify himself with us so that we can feel that we can identify with him and thus become heirs, and that's what we're talking about here, of everything. God is going to move his headquarters from wherever it is now to this planet when the thousand year when the millennium is over. What does that say to you? He's saying, you people, I think you're so important to me, I'm going to move my headquarters to your place. That's amazing. We're special. Very special. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, in the Old Testament, we see evidence, uh, piled upon evidence, that the Jews, who were originally entrusted with this incredible bounty, this wonderful inheritance that God was offering to them, chose to, to claim all the privileges and essentially ignored all the responsibilities. Could we make that same mistake? So what were their responsibilities? They were supposed to witness to the rest of the world. That's the one big responsibility. They were supposed to be the witnesses for God to the rest of the world. And what were the privileges? Privileges were, I'm going to give you this land that didn't belong to you. I'm going to, you know, and on and on. Even out there in the desert, he said, your shoes won't wear out, your clothes won't wear out, none of your women will, will abort, and on and on. Just. If you go back to Deuteronomy 27 and 28 just as an example, just a whole slew of, of privileges God promised them if they would just obey Him. Well, you know, instead of um, sharing the gospel, they even went to the point of, I can't even touch your shadow. I, your shadow can't touch me. And the court of the Gentiles, yeah. did they let any Gentiles in? I mean, they were so uh, 
uppity and didn't want to touch anybody from fear of being contaminated. And God wanted them to be strong enough to give his message to other people. Well, that's the ditch on one side of the road. The ditch on the other side of the road is what they were doing back in Judges. Oh, well, there they were sharing the women of the uh, the. There others. they were getting as close to these pagans as they could possibly get, and worshiping with them, following their pagan customs, you know, and doing all the other things so that we won't talk about on TV. And, and get God out. wanted the middle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So, during the last evening that Jesus spent with his disciples here on this earth, after washing their di dirty feet, and speaking to Judas so that he got up and left. He said to the eleven, I don't want you to be slaves any longer. I want you to be my friends. And that's found in John 15, 15, if you want to check it. What would you rather be, an heir? A friend? Or a son? A daughter? Not a slave. A slave? Not a slave. You don't want to be a slave. I'd be happy to be a slave in heaven. I don't mind cleaning the toilets in heaven <laughs> as long as I get there. Yeah, yeah. God doesn't invite those kind of people up there. No, doesn't, he doesn't have any plans for anybody to do that kind of a job. I was thinking I'd clean the horse stalls. Yeah. <laughs> I would want to be his friend because an heir doesn't necessarily mean that you have a relationship with that person. Yeah. Unfortunately, we all know stories, I'm sure, of, of people who uh, maybe inherit, were, were in line to inherit their parents' estate, but they weren't friends of their parents at all. That's really sad. Well, Paul goes on, he, he, he sort of addresses that question without sort, sort of indirectly because he says, when you actually become a part of Christ's body, that is the Christian church, you are supposed to become so close to God that you can actually call him daddy or papa. Would you feel comfortable if somebody got up in church and said, good morning, father, uh, I'm sorry, good morning, daddy. Good morning, papa. <coughs> Is that, would that be irreverent? Well, it depends on who you are. <laughs> it depends on who you are. Yeah, you're not well, allowed to say that unless no, you're a real Christian. No. Huh? It's just, you know, when I grew up, I used to call my dad, Daddy. Mm -hmm. And then and then when I got older, I called him Dad. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just a maturity thing, I think. But the point is still made with the Daddy thing. But, um, so, I, I, I'm not quite sure that that would apply to everybody. I see. I think it strongly depends on the person, if you know that person individually, and mm -hmm. they can't even say hello to you when you're passing in the hallways, mm -hmm. and then they go up, you know, and pray this elegant prayer, and call God Father, or Daddy, mm -hmm. y you see the hypocrisy in that. Yeah. I know an elderly lady who refers to God the Father as Papa, mm -hmm. and I think it's yeah, it's appropriate. Nice. Yeah. Well, I, you know, there's some friends of mine that they go to their dad and they call them, call their dad father. Uh -huh. You know, and they actually say, "Father, can I do this for you, father, or something like that?" To me, I think that's just just so formal. It isn't comfortable for me. Uh -huh. You know, and it's completely comfortable for them. So yeah. it's just yeah. yeah it yeah, depends on what the word means yeah, to you. Yeah. Now you remember that. In our previous lesson, we talked about the famous paidagogas, or the paidagogoi, the plural, in, in, in Greek and Roman times. And these were trusted slaves who basically would be put like completely in charge of one or two sons. I mean, discipline them, take care of them, teach them what's right, make sure they do their homework, et cetera, et cetera. Everything about this child, okay, until the child becomes of age and adult and able to take care of himself. Now. Those slaves were, were everything to that child at that point. But when the child becomes mature, what happens as far as the inheritance is concerned? <coughs> they were never the sons or daughters of those paidagogoi. They were the sons and daughters of their parents. And when it came time for inheritance, 
they were the ones who got it, right? Well, look at Galatians 4, chapter 4, the first three verses. Paul goes on, now to continue, suggesting that this is a, this is a continuation of his argument from chapter 3. The son who will receive his father's property is treated just like a slave while he is young, even though he really owns everything. While he is young, there are men who take care of him and manage his affairs until the time set by his father. And who are those people called? What are they called? We just talked about it. Pidagogos. The Pidagogos, or Pidagogoi in plural. In the same way, we too were slaves of the ruling spirits of the universe before we reached spiritual maturity. Who are the ruling spirits of the universe? Now, there's different ways that can be translated. Um, some people call it the elementary things of this world. Um, perhaps if, if we compare it with other places like Colossians 2.15 well, and Hebrews 5.12 where this verse is used. My Bible says it differently. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. Okay, elemental things of the world, yeah. Okay, uh, one possibility is that that refers to the, the beginning steps of the Christian life. And maybe that would be appropriate here, in light of everything else that Paul says. Well, going back to the the caretakers, mm -hmm. the um, pedagogoi. Yeah, I'm not going to attempt that. <laughs> Is there a simpler word in English for that? Well, not, we, not th really. that word has actually been taken into English, but it's come to mean something quite different in English. A pedagogue. There's a word called a pedagogue, and mm -hmm. but we don't. It means something completely different in English. Now, would Paul's point be that we have reached the point where we don't need them anymore? We that, need them until we are mature enough, so we don't need them. But it, it sounds like he's making the point now that these people that are coming telling the Galatians that they have to do this, that, or the other thing, that he's that they're trying to get them to go back to yep. that. But now Christ has come, and now the whole uh, message or the whole religion has moved into this new, more mature yes. thing. So, Well, let's talk about that for a moment. There's a famous verse found in Matthew 18. And I'm going to start with actually verse 2, but the, the key verse is in verse 3. So Jesus called a child. Now, and maybe I should really start with verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Okay? So Jesus called a child, made him stand in front of them, and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, what does that mean? And you've probably heard sermons about this, of various kinds of things. What is that supposed to mean? I could bring some child up that what you wouldn't want to see as a <laughs> poster child of yes. what Jesus was talking about. Yes. But I guess the child that he brought up was one that might have been teachable, that listened, that um, was enthusiastic with what Jesus was saying. But he doesn't say, um, you know, be like this, very respectful, obedient, da 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 da, da child. Well, well it is like if a, a child. child was like that. I mean, how do you know so you what kind of a child he brought up to put at his feet? Wasn't he referring to, um, could it be that he was saying that we should have faith like a child? What, what kind of faith does a child have? They believe everything that they're told. Does that mean our faith is supposed to be gullible? No, God doesn't want us to be that way. So, but isn't that what you just said the children are? Yeah, in a sense, yes, because they're dependent upon their parents for everything. Yeah, they have to have a trust. So you're you're saying the the key idea here is dependence is is. Well, when we we hear his voice, he says, when we hear that my my sheep will hear my voice and they'll recognize. So we don't have to worry about believing things that are not so because we'll recognize the voice. It, well, it, seem, it seems almost natural that, uh, that children have an instinctive trust mm -hmm. in, in their parents. They can even have some pretty bad parents, um, but they, they have, unless they've just really suffered tremendous abuse, 
they just have a natural instinct to have confidence in that parent, to yeah. trust that parent. Okay. And um, yeah, and well. Jesus brought up something that uh, <coughs> if you if you fool this type of a person, or you um, tell them a lie, or um, lead them in, lead them astray, he gets pretty. Christ gets pretty upset at that. Yeah. In I, fact, tie a rock around your neck and throw you in the river. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's yeah. right. So there must be there must be some sort of acceptance with this child that well, he's looking for. What, in what, everybody. What's the most important thing about a child? His Your capacity to grow. His capacity to grow. If a child fails to grow physically, what do we do? We become very concerned, don't we? If a child fails to grow mentally, even more concerned, right? What if a child fails to grow spiritually? No, most it, of the time we that's don't. That's wonderful, right? Most of <laughs> the time we don't even don't even check it out. A lot of people don't even <laughs> re know that, recognize that. Discouraging. There's a passage so, that might so give that, us a. So that, oh, you're going on the same. There's a there's a passage here that a few verses that might help us to understand our attitude about this. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 13. And I'm reading, of course, from my Good News Bible. Ephesians 4, verse 13. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people. Now, is that in contrast to, to, to children? Sounds like it, doesn't it? We what, shall become... What verse are you? I'm reading verse 13 of Ephesians 4. Oh, okay. Okay. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children, <clears throat> carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people. Don't we believe that the devil is going to be coming some point to our world and he's going to be throwing around every deceitful doctrine you can possibly imagine, right? He's doing that now. Yeah, even now. We don't going to be like children carried by the winds and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. Under His control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. So that's quite a different message than we should be like children. Unless, of course, we believe the most important thing about children is their capacity to grow. It sounds to me like that's what Paul would thought it meant. The way that we should be like children. So if we're stuck in the mud and we're, we're too rigid to change in any way, even though we're exposed to new truth, we don't qualify. The real childlike person says, I want to know, I'm going to investigate. I'm, you know, and you've all seen the kid who just will not leave something alone until he's figured it out. You know? And that's yeah. the way we should be. Uh, kids that come up and ask questions and ask questions and ask questions and <laughs> until you, you want to get them to go away. I think it's too <laughs> Yeah. Because somewhere in Jeremiah it does speak about, what chapter is that? Do you know where it speaks about it? the potter and the clay, oh, that's 18, I think I in the same sense, you know, you could apply that to this yeah. children's portion of the verse. That's your plan. Just some, somebody that's pliable, you know? Well, yeah. it, it, one, one thing we've suggested before, and I'll say it again here, if the, your picture of God hasn't changed in the last year, you're probably worshiping a, a graven image. Hmm. I mean, you may think you're worshiping the true God, and that may be your intent. But if your picture of God hasn't grown, if you aren't moving at all in the last year, it's a pretty dead God you're worshiping. The infinite one who's greater than anything outside yeah. of time and space. You know, it's our responsibility to be the absolute best of what we are, mm -hmm. so we fit in this whole contraption that Jesus is putting together so it all works together and hold up our, our little end. We need to, we need to keep moving because oh. there's a lot of things to talk about still in this lesson. Look at Galatians 4, verse 4 now. We read verses 1 to 3. Verse 4 is a key verse for many reasons. 
But when the right time finally came, the King James says when the fullness of time came, God sent His own Son. He came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law. And then verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law so that they might become son, God's sons and daughters. What is the fullness of time? What does that imply? the appropriate time in the scan, uh, span of time since God began to create. We should go way back, not just since Adam and Eve, but way back yeah. in, in heaven. Well, there, I mean, w there's and some, then, and this what pastors will often mention, uh, and it's appropriate. They talk about the Pax Romana, you know, the, the, the universe, well, the worldwide sort of peace at that point in time. The Romans ruled about everything, and there was a sort of, you know, one culture, one language was commonly used, their communication was better, transportation was better, there were roads leading through all the way across one country and into another country. So it made it easier for the gospel to spread. But there's another reason why the this was the fullness of time that is very seldom recognized, I think, by Christians, and I think it should be recognized more. The sect of the Pharisees had come to dominate the culture in Palestine. They seemed to be super religious people, and they certainly wanted you to think they were. But it was those same Pharisees who were, who were most determined to get rid of Jesus. They were people who seemed to dedicate their whole lives to serving God, and they ended up crucifying the very God they claimed to be serving. This demonstrates that if you aren't willing to look at God and really see what He's like and to become like Him, then you can pretend to be serving him and be just as wicked as the guy who's way to the other end that's, that's following the pagan gods. In other words, as we sometimes say, the ditch is just as deep on both sides of the road. Now, you know, when I see plays or dramas about Jesus' life and you look at the bad guys, they always look like bad guys. <laughs> I guess what you're saying is that these guys were the cream of the crop they were the most religious people. They mm -hmm. were looked up to and everything, and yet they still crucified Jesus. Yeah. Now here's a question, just to sort of put that in context. If Jesus had appeared in the Old Testament, do you think they would have killed him? Or would they just have ignored him like they, they ignored the Old Testament prophets? I think they would have thought he was crazy, just ignored him. I think they would have ignored him. Yeah. Why, what was the difference then? Well, that's my question. That's exactly the question. Why was it that the Pharisees particularly, and later they, they recruited the Sadducees when Jesus started raising people from the dead, they were pretty uncomfortable with that. But basically the Pharisees, almost from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, they were determined to kill him. The Bible just says so in so many words. Why? Is that because the prophecies pointed to Jesus? No. I think it's because they would always think that he's blaspheming and they didn't believe that he's God in the human form and so they thought he was making a mockery of God and claiming to be this divine entity and they probably thought, well, who does he think he is? He can't get away with yeah. these kind of... He his, did not fit their picture of God. Exactly. His, his actions may not have been... Um, uh, bad, but his theology was. Yes. Economically. According to them. That's right. Economically, they were threatened too. Remember what Caiaphas says? The word gets out about Jesus, the one who's going around healing the sick, and now he's feed, feeding thousands of people with a couple of loaves and two fishes, and now he's raising the dead. We got to put a stop to this because he says the whole world's going to go after him. What they're saying is we're going to be out of a job. Yeah. <clears throat> I think if Jesus came, even in the Old Testament times, they, he, they still would have put him to death because they put several of the other prophets to death. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, it's, it's, I'm sure they, they wouldn't be comfortable with him, I'm sure. But well, I, I God, think here, in the New Testament, what we see is the Old Testament, the people could care less, basically, I mean, about religion. By and large, they, they were busy worshiping at fertility cult shrines and all that kind of stuff. and. You know, a Pharisee in the Old Testament, would have, they would have just laughed at him. But you come to the New Testament, and they'd gone all the way across the road, and they're in the other ditch. And God showed that the ditches in both sides of the road are just as bad. I think he probably, if he would have come 
earlier, he would have presented himself differently. Oh, sure. It, it, yeah. no, I mean, he did present himself differently in the Old Testament mm -hmm. because even Jesus says that the Old Testament is written about me, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. Yeah. But the time of the New Testament was a time where he could get the lessons he wanted to get across. Get so, across. in light of that, again, the next big, these are big questions, and we're not going to answer them all in this short session. Was it necessary for Christ to be fully God and fully human to do what he did? Evidently. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for those words of wisdom. <laughs> but why? I want to know why. Well, there's, first of all, you've got to see God, and then you've got to see him somehow. He had to know? understand God's sovereignty mm -hmm. 100% as well as humanity 100% in order to say that he walked in our shoes. He knows mm -hmm. where we're coming from with mm -hmm. this whole sin issue. Mm -hmm. And yet he still had to understand God 100% in order to show us who God is. Mm -hmm. yeah. but it's kind of hard for him to not be God 100%. Well, the math, so fully God, it's kind of hard. To, the math doesn't make sense, but what we're talking about, though, that's <laughs> the only thing. Yeah. There's probably people listening and saying, that, that doesn't add up. What are you guys talking about? I bet if we looked for him, <laughs> if we, we'd find this, this Christian knee guy, I bet he would have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> Where it wasn't a good Well, many of our Christian friends, let's, just, let's be honest about this now. Many of our Christian friends would say that Jesus needed to come and live and die in order to pay the price for sin. He's here, he came here to pay the legal penalty. And Jesus never told us that he was going to do that. Does justice require that someone die? In some warped world it does. Well, by now let's, let's be honest. Um, we need to be fair with the Old Testament. If you go back to the Old Testament, and I don't have time to go to all the details now, but if you go back and look through Exodus and Leviticus particularly, and some on into Numbers and Deuteronomy, you'll find that every one of the Ten Commandments, with the exception of the Tenth, which you can't positively nail, whether some, nail down whether somebody's actually coveting, but every one of the other ten has a death decree connected to it for breaking it. <coughs> okay? So, what does that mean? Does someone need to come and, and pay that penalty? Because we all break the Ten Commandments. So someone needs to pay the price. That's what our Christian friends would say. And who are you paying to? Who well, that's the question. It? Who demands it? Who? I keep thinking that he must be an evil banker. You know that I needs see. to, you know, needs this payment, or else you're going to get your house foreclosed on and you get yeah. thrown out. Well, there are certainly a lot of terms that seem to refer to that. There's, you know, we're we're redeemed. That's a that's a biblical term. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is, uh, you know, there's passages that seem to, you know, to use those kinds of terms. Is, is it pay, the, is, pay the yeah, debt or the? Is it the father that died that's in our this? place? And is the father the one who's demanding this? When was this price paid? When, when was it? When was the costly part of Jesus? Of course, it was when he left it, heaven, it, wasn't it? it? Well, that to, would be to, to part of it. Come and live as a human being but also to, to represent God. And to my understanding, Jesus is going to play that role for eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that, when he left heaven to come as a baby, that, that was when he really paid a price. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't give him at the cross. He gave him when he left heaven. That was a big gift. He, he also gave more when he went to the cross. I would say that's... But, well, that was the ultimate demonstration about God because God had been accused of being arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacted, severe, tyrannical, it, it, despotic. And so he had to demonstrate how God really is because of that uh, great, great controversy quote there. Eight, what, 855? 555. 555, sorry. sorry. Well, maybe, maybe he had to pay ignorance. Well, you, does he? Have, did he need ignorance with um, so. knowledge? Maybe in the Garden of Eden, God said, "If you sin, you, you will, will die." die. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, "If you sin, Jesus will die," or he just said, "If you sin, you will die," or "If you sin, he's not going to kill you." God says, "If you sin, you will die." Did someone need to assuage or propitiate the Father's wrath against sin? 
Wow. Lo big lo yeah. love of Propitiate's a strong word. I don't think God's that's, up there. That's, that's, that's what the King James says, Romans 3, 25. Yeah, but that's not the God we serve where he's folding his arms and he's just wrathful and wanting to zap somebody because... Well, does the son need to plead with the father to get him to forgive us? Well, he says he intercedes for us, but... You know, there's a place where he says he doesn't. There's, there's some indication to lead us believe that um, that when Jesus became human, mm -hmm. uh, fully human, mm -hmm. or however much human he came, whatever theology you have, there's some evidence to indicate that he's going to retain part of that nature forever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a lot of theology there, deeper than what I can, but certainly it appears from biblical passages that he's going to retain, you know, it says when, when we go to heaven, if we've had spear pokes on our side, that's all going to go away. We're going to be restored to our perfect human nature like Adam and Eve was, but we're going to be able to go up and look at that stuff in Jesus. Correct me if that. Yeah. And and that he is he is retaining. Uh, some would say he's no longer uh, omnipresent like he mm -hmm. was, so that he has made. If that is correct, he has made a, a sacrifice, sacrifice for whatever reason. He has transferred at least in part from being fully God into being partly human forever. Mm -hmm. Um. So, in a sense, there, there's a kind of death there. There's a kind of, and it, it could be that, it could be said that that had to occur in order for him to do whatever he came here to do. Okay. So, well, the, the main metaphor in this particular passage in Galatians is adoption. What does adoption mean? We're being adopted into the family of God. You only adopt children. Okay, well, For errors. In, in here, uh, in Paul's writings, let me put it that way, it's a, more than just right in this passage. Paul promised us a final victory over the devil and his temptations. He pro promised us a final freedom from death. He promised us freedom from sin and all that that implies. In fact, one place he says Christ just came to, to deal with sin, even to do away with sin. And then he promises a freedom from the condemnation of the law and... and uh, there are verses in the Bible, clearly in Paul's writings, that talk about all those things. So, could we, do we really become fully children of God? I mean, heirs of God? No, well, I thought we were creations of God. So, how do you, why do you go through all that? When because we mess things up. I know, but no, still, no matter there's, what, there's, there's a, who no, else owns us? Dogs and birds and cats and everything else is a created too, but mm -hmm. they're not inheriting what we're inheriting. Well, it's interesting to go back and look at the context in which these words were spoken. Even in the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day, there were certain very specific rules about what happens when you get adopted. One, the adopted son or daughter becomes the true son or daughter of his adopter. That person is fully ch a child of that person. The adopter agrees to bring up the child properly, provide the necessities of food and clothing. The adopter could not repudiate his adopted said You can't say when he starts messing his pants or whatever like this, you know, out, and I'm done with you. I don't want you anymore. Can't do that. The child can never be reduced to slavery, and the child's natural parents can never claim him back again. The, the adopted child, in fact, it enters into the right to inherit the property of the of the of the parent, the, the adopter. Now, some of you will remember that some of the famous Caesars were adopted children of their of their predecessors. Mm. They weren't Caesars at all. They were adopted into Caesar's family and became the next Caesar. So, what's most important to be adopted or to be a friend? Well, I was going to come back to that. What do you think? <laughs> I believe it's to be adopted because you're fully restored to the plan that God initially had for us, which was okay. to be His children and reflect His image as children. 
Well, I, I've seen some people be, kids that were adopted, fight with each other. Um, mm. But Even they're not exactly parents. friends with each other. But if they were friends, they wouldn't fight with each other. So um, I don't know. It's probably just the metaphor, what it, what it does for a particular thought. I know in uh, Isaiah chapter 43 says that we will be more. He will give us a name greater than of sons and of daughters. Mm. So this exceeds friends. This mm. exceeds even sons and daughters. He goes so far as to say he will give us a name greater than that of sons and of daughters. What do you think Jesus had in mind when he said those famous words found in John fifteen fifteen? I do not, this is to his disciples, at the end of the upper room experience, just before they're headed out to, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane. I do not call you servants any longer. Now that word is slaves. And we don't hear him calling his disciples slaves. But he says, I do not call you slaves any longer because slaves do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I've heard from my father. Now, what's the distinguishing characteristic, the difference between slaves and friends? Friend gets led into all the conversations, all the thinking, everything. Mm -hmm. A friend wants to be there. A slave has to be there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I, you know... understands what the other friend is is doing mm -hmm. and why perhaps so where does that uh, where does that put a friend in comparison to uh, um, an, an heir well can't you be an heir heir <laughs> yeah a friend and a friend <laughs> well that's that's of course Paul's ideal isn't it yeah. he says I want you to be uh, an heir and to be so close to your father that you call him daddy or papa now we're running out of time here, but let's, let's, let's think about this. In conclusion, I think we can say that um, Paul is not, in, in, some people are concerned because it goes on here in Galatians to talk about days and months and years and seasons. Some people have used that to suggest that the Sabbath wasn't, was done away with. That's certainly not Paul's intent. You look at Colossians 2 and he, he mentions the Sabbath specifically. But Having said that, God wants us to be friends. He wants us to be heirs. He wants to be children, us to be children who love him in every way. We'll see you again next week.